You are now listening to Extreme Cinema with Andrew Legank and David Lawler. If you like sex and violence, evil brunettes, and angelic blondes, then stick with us as we debate some of the best and worst of action and exploitation filmmaking. What's going on, you motherfucker? So we were talking. We were talking just a minute ago about well my my theory about what the old school liberal would have been and to right. me i don't you know the thing about john batham is he he has liberal sensibilities you have to kind of be to survive in the industry as he did for many years but yeah. after a time he began to sound more like a conspiracy nut because he actually believes a lot of the things that a lot of the the stuff that he puts forth in his movies but today I, I, I don't know. He might appear to be a little more well, leaning right, I would say. Well, when the, when the left, the left was, uh, the left used to be the, you know, they were the side of conspiracies, really. Um, yeah, yeah. They were, um, they were the ones who, you know, like, uh, I know it, it always amused me how the left would, could never look at themselves. You know, every single sci-fi movie or sci-fi story yeah. Like even the writers who write them think that they're left wing, like government, they're, they're right wing governments, but they're always these these left wing, like crazy governments. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 well, yeah. The birth, the actual, the big birth of conspiracy thrillers was right. probably in the '90s when you had like the X Files and stuff like that. That right. was when Clinton was president. You know. Holy shit! Right, right. So, and and, and they, they used to be the ones who did the conspiracy stuff, and now th then they became the establishment and the man. So they don't like conspiracies. In fact, they call everything a conspiracy until they decide that it's not. Tucker Khan, Tucker Khan. Like, which is, you know, that's their little game that they play. It's like, oh, well, you can't get your news unless it comes through the New York Times. And then right. so, so we don't admit that the news is true until it comes from the New York Times. Three months later, they finally admit it. And th then and only then is it not some crazy wild conspiracy theory that Facebook can ban from being shared. Yeah. You know, <laughs> of course, a lot of Facebook stuff is coming out these days. There's oh, yeah. so much crap about the news that's coming in. I mean, oh, basically, Mark Zuckerberg pretty much admitted um, the end of last year, I think, whoever has the most money will get their news shown on Facebook. And that's it's... why we get stories about Planet X, the invisible rogue fucking planet that's going to crash into us and kill us all. Why do you put that up there and call that news? Not okay! The one, the one, that, the one that gets me, and I don't believe this for one second, that this even exists. I believe that this entire thing is some astroturfed weird thing that they've just created just for propaganda purposes is this new flat earth society. I do not believe that this thing exists That's... at all. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I look at that like... shit. I watch I watch Joe Rogan and he has people on who swear by this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, no. They're like, talking about, yeah, the earth is flat. This has all <laughs> been an elaborate lie. <laughs> I, I really think it is. I really think it is. I think I think it's a setup. So something to cause division or something? Is it's it? like the Westboro Baptist Church. It's a setup so that it so that it, you can compare other like more normal people to them. Mm. Like so you could say, Oh, well you 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 deny global warming. Well you're just like the flat earth society. Yeah. The new Ooh, like, that sounds pretty good. That that, you know, that would be a good a good comparison between yeah. the two. What would you little maniacs like to do first? Well, I think what, what John Badham was doing when he did movies like Blue Thunder and War Games were right. techno horror. I call them techno horror because we take something, something that we create, and it winds up becoming a tool of destruction. Blue Thunder being this, this crazy helicopter, War Games being, of course, the, the nuclear uh, strategic defense initiative and things like that. Right. So whatever it was, it was always in reaction to that. That's the kind of stuff that he was doing. If you look at his – I did send you a long time ago the trailer – he narrated. He did the commentary for the trailer for, of his own movie, Blue Thunder, at um, uh, well, trailersfromhell.com. It's a great trailer. He talks. It's just a regular theatrical trailer, and he's like, "This is a movie I made. It's called Blue Thunder. We actually predicted this, and this happened. They are spying on us with helicopters. This is something that John Batten and I, I believe him too, because I see, I see a lot of crazy helicopters out there at night too. Uh, I don't know if you do helicopters, dude. They could do it with drones. They, drones. They, yeah. They had black helicopters back in the day. They got drones. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Do you see any of them in your neck of the woods? I see plenty sure. of them around here. I do. I, I see. I see stuff all the time. You know, there's, there's, there's really like privacy is becoming rapidly if it is, if it isn't already a thing of the past. Yes, um, and and naked women can't do yoga anymore. <laughs> great ass. 
Um, well, I don't want to. That's cultural appropriation. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so Blue Thunder. Okay, you know, I, I the reason I picked John Badham. This this is like one. It, 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 I was really impressed by this. I, I, I got the movie on Blu-ray recently. Well, no, I got it a while back, but I got it for like five bucks for some reason. Yeah, um, uh, Blue Thunder you're talking about? Yeah, Blue Thunder. Yeah. On Blu-ray, I uh, popped it in for my vintage cable box review. I'm watching it. It's such a gripping fucking movie to watch. It's awesome. The way it was done, it was done with, it was all practical visual effects. There was no green screens. There were no computers involved in any of this. And even Badham says on the commentary, he says, you couldn't do this today. They would not let you shoot this movie today like this. It would be right. all just visual effects and everything else. What do we got? Hi, I'm John Badham. We're talking about my 1983 film, Blue Thunder, which is a kind of dark look at how the prophecies of George Orwell in his novel 1984 had turned out. What brings you to air support? Kind of like the idea of it. No guns, no kicking in doors, and you know, just quiet. So it all began when Dan O'Bannon, the writer of Alien, was increasingly harassed by the nightly intrusion of helicopters noisily swooping over his Los Angeles house, shining bright lights everywhere, and so he thought, peeping into his windows. Dan started to envision a super helicopter that could do not only all of these things, but much more. Pick up conversations from inside houses, fly silently in whisper mode, be invisible to radar, as well as being a flying fortress of rockets and machine guns that fired wherever the pilot was looking. He called it Blue Thunder. And though these ideas sprang from O'Bannon's brilliant imagination, ironically they were actually already in work deep in the bowels of the Defense Department skunk works. Just before the movie was released, the world started seeing photographs of the Army's new attack helicopter which bore an uncanny resemblance to the Blue Thunder helicopter created by Philip Harrison, our production designer. We now know that some of our so-called fantasies, such as Whisper Mode, where a helicopter could fly silently, were not just products of our fevered Hollywood imagination, but in fact were in use when we invaded, captured, and assassinated Osama bin Laden. Blue Thunder has as its main character a helicopter pilot played by Roy Scheider. And when he realizes how the government intends to really use Blue Thunder to create race riots before the 1984 Olympics in L.A. and decides to steal the helicopter from the government. And this results in an air battle over downtown L.A. between LAPD helicopters, ground troops, and F-16s out to destroy the Blue Thunder. And for 10 weeks, every Sunday when we were shooting, the homeless population of downtown L.A gawked at our helicopters flying through the streets, literally 50 feet above the pavement, in between buildings and down alleys. And since there was no such thing as CGI at the time, everything had to be done for real. Nowadays, nobody would ever allow such crazy stunt work in a populated area. And nowadays, Blue Thunder's capabilities are Zippo by comparison to what the combined forces of the NSA, the CIA, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the internet have done not only to invade our privacy, but magically convince us that privacy is an old fashioned idea that we don't need. Oh, oh no. Obviously we just lost the satellite feed. That sucks. I guess George Orwell was right. Big brother 100, people zero. Two plus two does equal five. So how many movies have we done with Roy Scheider in them? Uh, uh, Roy Scheider has been a recurring guest star on our show. He has. You're going to need a bigger boat. He uh, I mean, we started. What did we, have, uh, we had Sorcerer. Sorcerer, uh, Cohen and Tate. Cohen and Tate, right. 52 we had Pickup. Another, um, which one? 52 Pickup. 52 Pickup, yep. There's another one. Um, Is there another fuck. one? I'm thinking of, uh, oh yeah, he's in um, um, Marathon Man. The, the 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 is it safe? I don't know. Marathon Marathon Man. Man. Yes. Yeah. So this is his yeah. fifth appearance, right? And once again, uh, playing a, another one of these solid, reliable characters. It's just a fantastic character. You have Frank Murphy. 
He's in the Los Angeles Police Department. He runs the helicopter division over there. He's a Vietnam vet, so he's got he gets nom flashbacks with with Malcolm McDowell, uh, who I guess is evil, right? Yeah. So he's British got this evil. Yeah, yeah, and and he's got this new uh, partner played by Daniel Stern, who would I guess later oh he would later become um, the popular in the Home Alone movies. Yes. So he goes to the, he's kind of like wacky, he's off the wall, Frank, Frank Murphy is, but he's re, well respected. War Notes, this is one of War Notes' last, I believe this might be his last film, I'm not sure. Is it his last? Yeah. I, mean, I always uh, liked War Notes. War Notes is the shit, man. Yeah, I mean, man. god damn. Bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. All this Sam Peckinpah stuff is awesome. And give me a glass of hot fat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Actually, no. He had appeared in a movie called Tough Enough, but it was released posthumously, as was uh, Blue Thunder. Um, uh, Tough Enough was, I think, a Dennis Quaid movie. He played, played like a boxer or something. Ah, uh, yeah. And Warren Oates was in it. I do remember that being a cable favorite. I but, never but, saw it, but I remember it. I remember hearing about it. I, I like but, the but, song that was from the movie Tough um, Guys, Tough Enough. Um, he was also in, well, before Blue Thunder, he was in The Border, which was a movie with Jack Nicholson, which I remember. Yeah, it was me. Don't waste my motherfucking time! Who did but, that? I mean, you want to look oh, back to his back and paw days. Now, that's that's what's up. Yeah. In this movie, uh, Scheider, is, uh, Scheider and Stern go to this demonstration of Blue Thunder. Blue Thunder is this advanced, experimental helicopter. They don't even want to call it a helicopter. They want to call it, like, tech, advanced uh, aircraft or something like that. Right. And, they, I mean, this thing can do so much. They take it out for a test run, and you can run stealth. No one hears the engines. You've got, like, recorders. You can videotape. You've got infrared. They spend most of their time. I wrote in my review that, you know, I mean, with this advanced piece of weaponry, that they spend a lot of their times watching their cop buddies have sex with hookers. And right. then watching uh, women do naked yoga in skyscrapers. But... <laughs> Yeah. They manage to pick up on a crime that's happening where, like these these, uh, I guess thugs are out there, and they they like they 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 rape this uh, congresswoman or something, right? And this congresswoman, yeah, yeah the, it turns out to be this whole big conspiracy thing because they they rape her and later she dies from her injuries or something like that. And but it dun, turns dun, out dun, <laughs> it man, it actually has something to do with the whole helicopter program. It has, to, yeah, because the idea. And with the help of Malcolm McDowell and the Department of Defense cronies that he's working with and, and a couple of other and these low level thugs, there's this project called Thor, which is a tactical helicopter offensive response. So Project Thor. And it's what they want to do is they want to use helicopters like Blue Thunder to uh, mm -hmm. control the population, to create a, st a constant state of martial law and things like that. Right. And so they put it together. Unfortunately, I mean, like when you're when you're the partner of the hero in the action film, you're pretty much going to die. You might right. as well you might yeah. as well be like engaged to Charles Bronson in a Death Wish movie. Your days are numbered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're going to die. You may get raped too. <laughs> so Daniel Stern, I mean, like he says, take the tape that we have that has this this incriminating evidence on it, hide it, and get it back to me later. So he does hide it, but he gets killed. But he leaves a special message for him before right. he was killed. That he left it in um, in the parking lot of a drive-in theater, which is awesome. I just love. I and, and the whole the final third of the movie is incredible because Scheider gets his girlfriend to drive mm -hmm. like a fucking maniac and get this get this tape and then deliver it to a news station. I was on the edge of my seat watching it. I, it was yeah, fantastic. it was it was exciting towards the end. Uh, yeah, it's really. I, I've, and, I've always thought of it as kind of a middling, you know, kind of action movie. It was never one of my favorites. It's 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 good. It's okay. Sunday afternoon movie. I think maybe. it's a lot better these days. It plays a lot better these days than it did back then, probably. I still, that you know, I don't know. I, I, I still wasn't, I wasn't as enamored with it as you were. I, I, not that I don't like it. It's totally worth seeing, and it's a good movie. I still pull it out once in a while and watch it, you know. But uh, um, it's, uh, you know, not. It's that doesn't rate up there for me as like, you know, some a must see, you know. Um, and it was a hit on a budget of eleven. They shot all that. They shot all that. Everything you see. Right uh, for eleven million dollars. Well, eleven in, million went a lot farther in nineteen eighty three. In eighty three, and it and, and it was a po and it was popular. It made us money back. It was a box office hit. It right. wasn't like a big. John Badham is very interesting. His movies up until uh, I need to check my notes on this, but I believe his movies up until another stakeout on uh, strangely enough were all money makers. They all turned a profit. 
Another stakeout didn't make money. I mean, I know no, it wasn't that was as, a, as that big was the hit first... as it should have been, as, it, as they wanted it to be. But I didn't think it was. A big I got hit. I got two words for you, Rosie O'Donnell. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> God help us. It, you know, it's like I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I was like, "You want to destroy a franchise, yeah, Rosie O'Donnell?" Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, according to the yeah, War Games big hit, Short Circuit big hit, Dracula, Saturday Night Fever, of course, uh, The Hard Way was right. his last movie to make money. The Hard Way was not good. I didn't like The Hard Way. That was uh, what was that? James Woods and Michael J. Fox. I've right. tried to revisit that several times, thinking that I might. Yeah, and it, it has. And, and John Badham has this problem. And he has a problem in in in, uh, in one movie that we're going to discuss tonight. He has a very serious issue with tone. What I call tone problems. I, yeah, where a movie I, I, that's way I too was, violent for the amount of uh, humor uh, that's in it. It just doesn't, it doesn't. I I know what you're talking about. You're talking about Stakeout, right? Talking about Stakeout, and it actually works better than most movies with tone issues, but it still has them. Your your had, girl. Okay, I was watching. Well, I was I was watching Stakeout, and I was right. watching this as they're trying. They're, we've spent like we spent a long time with a situation comedy type situation, and right. then we get into this deep dark cop drama. And I'm I'm thinking in the back of my head, Andrew's going to say something about this. Yeah, I know. there's bookends, and, and like and, and you know what? I, I grew up watching Stakeout. I love I, I love Stakeout. I think it's it's a good movie. Um, and but anyway, we'll we'll revisit that later. We'll get but to that. Bookends with the with the the extremely violent. Um, stuff and then in the middle it's a comedy and that's weird well well, for Blue Thunder I think that what I really appreciate about Blue Thunder is the character development they spend a lot of time developing Roy Scheider's character this is time you would not necessarily grant to movies these days no you know? Although it's it it a little bit derivative, there's a little, there's some right stuff. Oh, there's a little there. formula, yeah. You know, there's, there's, you know, it's it's a Knight Rider. You know, there's there's, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of formula in there. But I do like that he's troubled. He's a Vietnam War vet. He's got an axe to grind with Malcolm McDowell. He's having problems with his girlfriend. I like and he's a girlfriend. little older. I like that he's he's an older guy. You know, Schneider like, is fantastic. I mean, like you look at his face, he's so weathered. He's got this weathered quality about him. Yeah. You don't want to fuck with him. No, you he's know? a badass. He's, he's a total. Seen, he's, seen hot, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's like an alpha male, and I fucking I, I appreciate that. I really like yeah. that. And you can That's see that. the difference between him and Daniel Stern. Daniel Stern is kind of like what today's hero would look like, you know. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, you see what they do to some of these heroes, quote unquote heroes in movies today. They're like asking the girl what to do and shit, you know. Like, <laughs> all right, you have you have incredible photography here by John Alonzo, and a right. great score by Arthur B. Rubenstein, who 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 was basically Badham's go to guy for scores. He did the scores for both movies, the other movies that we're going to talk about too. Written by Dan O'Bannon, which is written by uh, Dan O'Bannon. And uh, John, Don Jacoby, who's uh, you know nothing to write home about, but Dan, <laughs> Don Jacoby probably wrote all the bad shit. Dan O'Bannon wrote all the. Dan good O'Bannon shit. is the guy who made who gave us Alien. Yeah, he gave us yeah. lots of stuff, and he was. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, such and... an interesting man. He was always sick. He was sick most of his life. I forget what was wrong with him, but he was. Uh, I he um, died rather prematurely. I mean, he like, but the thing is. When he died, he was. Uh, let me see here. Really wasn't he was premature because he was sick forever. He was I mean, sixty three when he died, but he looked like he was fucking ninety three right before yeah, he kicked. Yeah. You know? But he he had been. I mean, let's see what else did he do. I mean, Dark Star, John Carpenter's. You he, know. Did, he also worked on the visual effects for Star Wars. He wrote, co-wrote right. Dead and Buried. He co-wrote Heavy, Heavy Metal, Metal, Life, Life Force, Force. For fuck's sake! Yeah. Oh my God, Life Force is awesome. Yeah, but Life to- Force was all about the naked chick. Invaders oh, yeah, from yeah, Mars. Yeah. So he did a Toby Hooper two for there. And then- <laughs> yeah, yeah, Invaders from uh, Return of the Living Dead, one of my personal favorites. Total Recall, he co-wrote. Recall, bad. Mm-hmm. He also did that one, Screamers, that uh, Peter Weller Screamers. himself told us. Peter about. Weller, yeah. yeah, the Peter Weller. <laughs> that was the one that Peter Weller told but told us to see. Now hemoglobin, I'm not familiar with. Oh boy, that looks. Oh, that cover. No wonder I didn't see that. <laughs> Fuck but, me. Um, yeah, just uh, it's, yeah. It's very Rucker talented Howard, writer. Though. <laughs> Why couldn't they just put Rucker Howard on the cover? I mean, come on, man. Yeah. God. But uh, I really enjoyed you. Too. You said it was uh, the movie wasn't. The great, a great, great movie for you, but it was, you know, yeah. still for for me, it's a cut above in the in the. Uh, I think the, the IMDb rating of six point four out of ten is about where I would put it. Hmm. You know, I'd put it at eight just for the thrills because it's very thrilling to watch. I would have loved to have seen it in the movie theater. It was rated R, so I couldn't. Ah, yeah, it was a little early, huh? I remember yeah. all the kids, the kids of my generation loved this movie. It's like one of that. 
Although my first R-rated movie was in 84 with Terminator 1. I think my first R-rated movie oh. that I saw was uh, Trading Places, I think. I saw I saw Running Scared. I saw Extreme Prejudice. Those were hard R movies. Running, yeah, Running Scared. But Running Scared was 86. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So those were R-rated movies before, you know, I mean, I, I, I would go out, I guess. If my mother really wanted to see a movie, she would take me. Like, she wanted to see Extreme Prejudice because, I don't know why, action. Never Walter like Hill. Prejudice. Could never sit through the whole movie. I'd rather enjoy it. I like it when Powers Boost just shoots that guy in the head. <laughs> well, let's wrap up Blue Thunder. Uh, like I said, I loved it. Uh, you not so much, but still, you you, you do not, acknowledge you know, the fun. I, you know, I have I, I can't say anything terrible about it. It's not bad. It's good. It's a good movie. It's a good movie. It's just I don't think it rises to the level of greatness. You know. Yeah, I would I would say just for see it for the visual effects alone because they're in camera. Yeah, they're real. Good movie. Uh, B square. Now, what's even more shocking is that War Games came out the same year. Yeah. Um, like a little more than a month later, War Games it's comes so out. Old, so much older. <laughs> what do we got? David Lightman was a master at computer games. A fast thinker. Oh, David! Maybe you could tell us who first suggested the idea of reproduction without sex. Your wife? <laughs> Get out, my man. And a promising student Hi. at an old game. Hi. With an electronic twist. Are those your grades? Yeah. I don't think that I deserved it, F. Do you? You can go to jail for that. Only if you're over 18. This computer company is coming out with these amazing new games in a couple of months. And I want to play those games. Wow. What? We got something. He found the right code word to play the game. We're in. But it was the wrong computer. Shall we play a game? How can I ask you that? How about mobile thermal nuclear war? Fine. All right. <laughs> What the hell? The trajectory headings for multiple impact re-entry vehicles. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's great. All stations, this is Crystal Palace. I wonder if I should use my subs. 22 Typhoon-class submarines departing Petropavlov. What in the hell's happening here? Oh, my God. Shall we play? I have seven. Correction, eight. That's eight Redbirds. Get on the sack. Tell them to flush the bombers. Russians are still denying everything, sir. Who are you working with? Nobody. I do not believe you. Over day, we have Soviet missile warning. Based on the arrest pending indictment for espionage. Espionage? Confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. Cobra Dane, is this an exercise? Negative, this is not an exercise. Give me the president on the horn. It's still playing the game. It's going to start a war. Close up the mouth. Clear. Clear. Is this a game, or is it real? War Games, playing soon at a theater near you. Shall we play? Um, well, looking at computers as they are. Now, War Games is a serious personal favorite of mine. It was a movie that appeared on cable around the time we got cable, so it was on all the time, and I watched it constantly. This is this is to me. I, I believe I gave this a uh, four star review for Vintage Cable Box because it, it's such an iconic movie, yeah. and it very much feeds into that paranoia, that kind of John Badham paranoia, where people are watching you, they're listening to your conversations. Um, he wants to uh, the, the main point I think of this because the script the story and the script for blue for I'm sorry for war games were written like a few years before mm -hmm. and it became out in conversations with someone who passed away recently Stephen Hawking Stephen Hawking was one of the inspirations for the character of um, of, of Stephen Falcon in the movie right uh, and what it was was to show that nothing was foolproof that there is a back door into any computer system no matter what. Now, you are a programmer. I studied computer programming. Mm -hmm. We know right. that there are ways in. Yes, there are. Yes. And and this kid, all he's trying to do, it's uh, Matthew Broderick plays his kid, David Lightman, and all he tries to do is um, he's looking for games. He's just looking for games to play from this new company, uh, ProtoVision, I think it is. So he's trying to find 
all of these uh, all, all all of these hidden games that are going to be coming out shortly. He's like an early adopter. He's like one of these people who buys an iPhone for like fifteen hundred dollars, <laughs> right? Know. Or he tries to steal one anyway. So he gets in. He 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 has like a modem. He has this computer system that is fairly sophisticated for the time. It's it's an MSI with a whole bunch of added on shit in nineteen eighty three right. or even nineteen eighty two when they were shooting it. Uh, so he's got like a fairly powerful computer system for the time. I mean, so of course it can't yeah. do any of the stuff that our stuff can do now. No, but... I mean, cause it's like <laughs> our phone has way more power now. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. He's got, so he's got like a modem and he's dialing in, to, he's dialing every phone number in this I particular mean, town. I'll never forget the first time I played with that, except I could never get it to do anything like, you know, interesting. But yeah, I mean, playing with a 300 baud modem and getting it to call, <laughs> getting numbers to call and try to get it to billboards and all this kind of shit. I remember um, one time I went to your apartment and and I, we were in your room. We were like going through your laser and I saw you had a, a computer. Yeah. There. I don't, I, I wasn't really good. It didn't look anything more advanced than a word processor, but I think it might have been an IBM. I'm not sure. Yeah, it was probably an IBM compatible um, at that. With a dot matrix printer, I think it had a dot matrix printer. Well, yeah, that's that's what I used to print my uh, print my screenplays and mm. stuff. Yeah. Right. So he dials every phone number in this town where this where this Protovision is. He winds up hooking into like a backdoor phone number of our government. Right. And so, you know, and and uh, he's, well, he's trying, trying to get in. He thinks he's looking. He's looking for a video game. He's looking to 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 get yeah. a, early access to a video game. Yeah, yeah, and it's, that's all that's all he wanted to do. Right. Uh, but he can't figure it out, but he figures out the name Falcon's Maze. There's a game called Falcon's Maze, so they so he puts two and two together, figures out Stephen Falking, so he starts reading up on this guy, trying to get into his head uh, to find a password that he can get in. Because programmers, and this is true, they say it in the movie, the programmers often leave little backdoor passwords for themselves so they can get true. in. true, yeah. So that they can circumvent any new security that the the system might put on, uh, he finds out he well he gets himself a little girlfriend played by Ellie Sheedy, and so they both they go they go see Eddie Deason of course Eddie Deason was in every one of these kind of God, movies back then. Got to see Eddie Deason. He's the one who knows all about computers and stuff because yeah. he talks funny and looks like he, well he's got he, he, his other friend is an older guy who looks like in his forties played by Maury Shaken. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, Eddie Deason is there. He's like, "You guys are so dumb. I got this whole thing figured out. Go right through <laughs> Falcon's maze." <laughs> so they go. So he does all this reading up. He finds out that Falcon's kid died. Falcon's kid Joshua died a long time ago. Uh, he got. He went into a deep depression. He retired. He died. He allegedly died. Uh, so Matthew Prodig puts it together that the password is Joshua. So he types in Joshua, and suddenly the computer starts talking to him, and it gives him a list of games. Global global thermonuclear war, theater wide biotoxic chemical warfare. I mean, like it's all this shit that sounds really cool today, actually. Yeah. Because all these games are very popular now. Yeah. But this is like I don't know. This is like a you know monochromatic or whatever kind of yeah. Kind of, what do you call that? Like a DOS system or something? It looks like well, DOS. yeah. It's definitely there's no like color graphics or anything, and you know it's all very simple stuff. But it was back then anyway. I mean they, they didn't have. You know, but it looks better than Pac Man right? graphics or anything. It, lo it looks like much ASCII better than text and shit. You know, it looks much better than Space Invaders anyway, for for being so cool. But it also has yeah. other games like poker and chess and backgammon because those are strategy games. These things, I guess, this from from the many times I've watched the movie, <clears throat> what I was led to believe is that these games were there to teach the computer strategy. Right. So it's 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 about teaching the computer strategy so that it can handle a real world event like nuclear war. Right. So he he's like playing this game with Ali Sheedy thinking they're just oh we're just playing a game. Yeah, let's nuke let's let's pretend to be the Russians because we don't really know any of the cities or towns in, in the Soviet Union. And this right. was at the height of the Cold War too, all of this. And he says, Okay, let's nuke Vegas, let's nuke Seattle. The the the, the show takes place the movie takes place in Seattle. Same as Stakeout, too, strangely enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so, fuck, you know, we, we I, I should have backtracked this because it has a killer opening, this movie, where you have two soldiers that are underground in the trenches it, at these computers. Michael Madsen and the guy from yeah. Lethal Weapon. I can't remember his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're like buddies, right? right? They work together. They're buddies. They're talking about how to grow their their kind of marijuana or something like that. Yeah. And they get in there. They turn their keys. They do their checks. And everything, and and then it gets down to oh fuck the alarm goes off, 
Sir, we are at launch. Turn your key. Michael Madsen is 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 the junior officer in this scenario. He pulls his gun on his boss. And because he says, his boss doesn't want to put, turn the key. Yeah, and, he doesn't uh, want to. It it's like, yeah. and that's the problem. That that in is the problem in war games is yeah. that they don't want to leave this enormous responsibility to people who are going to have second thoughts about doing it. Right. So they're He's trying like, to remove the people from it, which is, you know, an interesting idea. Like there's, there's sound logic behind it. There's sound logic. And it's interesting when they're yeah. having the debate between the general and um, and uh, Dabney Coleman. And Dabney but, Coleman, who is fucking awesome in this movie and the yeah. general too, Barry, Barry Corbin, I believe. But they're, they're having the debate. And the, the truth is they they both have valid, totally valid. They points. do. They do. Where, but where, where do you stand on it in that argument? I like I, I agree with I like Barry Corbin. People. I like having those boys down there. Yeah, I do too. I like. I, I, I think it should be people. I think just. I'm also just for the record. I think driverless cars are a fucking stupid, terrible <laughs> idea as well. Wow, I didn't know we were going to get into that. Yes, I completely agree with you on that too. I don't yeah. know about driverless. You know what I, I think, think about? A moronic millennial pipe dream that will never actually happen. Fuck you, millennials. Fuck you. Yeah, that's my message for you. Fuck you and kiss my ass. Remember. <laughs> Remember Johnny Cab from uh, Total Recall? That's a driverless car for you. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're talking, I mean, like, Dabney Coleman is kind of like a, sh he's kind of a shit kicker in his own way. He's a programmer in this. He was Falcon's partner devising the system called the Whopper. Yeah. Uh, which is Joshua, technically. I mean, the Whopper is Joshua. So right. he's like, uh, the computer, he said, I don't want my, my, my life dictated by these people because, it, you know, I don't want us to all die because these 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 people refuse to turn the keys when the computer tells them to so but for some reason dabney coleman's argument wins over the senator that's visiting and he, and he goes and he he recommends it to the president and that winds up being the bad thing really because it really does that's what that's what causes the the, yeah, the whole they, problem they take these kids out of the loop and then they put the computers in handling everything and that's why we get this nuclear war scenario and they go yeah. to defcon you know, I don't know. They have this DEFCON thing, DEFCON 5. You know, their security is pretty fucking weak. It's almost like a millennial designed their security. <laughs> um, they didn't have millennials then, so... What did they have then? other I mean, kind of incompetent person. What was your equivalent of a 20 or 30-year-old in 1983? It would be people older than us. I know, today. I know. So you would think that they would have better security, but, mm. <laughs> but apparently not. Apparently they were channeling their inner millennial... <laughs> so uh, they they trace it. They trace the scheme to to Broderick's house. He he figures out that oh shit, uh, this actually happened because there's a news report that says that we were on the brink of fucking World War Three. And he's like, oh my god. So he tries to throw everything away. <laughs> he just shoves everything in the garbage. Ah. Uh, they eventually track him down. They arrest him. They take him to uh, the uh, the base where Dabney Coleman is trying to figure out: Are you a Russian spy or something? Is he Donald Trump? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what what uh, do I do? I look like a Russian spy over here. I'm just trying to play a computer game here. Okay. <laughs> you see this watch? This watch costs more than your car. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but the um, coffee thou. You stupid fucking cunt. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Broderick, Matthew Broderick, is some kind of a fucking genius or something because he MacGyver's his way out of out of custody. And he hooks up with Ali Sheedy. They go, they find, they track down Stephen Falcon, who turns out it wasn't, he didn't die. He, they just, they just uh, gave him a fictitious death or something. So he's living out the rest of I don't think he, you know, it's, it's interesting, I, but I guess you could say that he's a genius. Or is everybody else really stupid? And he's and, like, well, like, okay. on, like normal intelligence. Do you remember <laughs> the scene where the security guard is trying to pick up the secretary? Yeah, and, like he's escaping while this guy's trying to pick him, pick her up, and he's being really kind of inappropriate with her in the workplace. Yes, he is. Yeah, I mean that was a Me Too moment right there. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, <laughs> hashtag Me Too. Yeah, <laughs> she should have tweeted that right away. <laughs> to, like, to and he's such a—he's so terrible at it too. He says, "You have pretty eyes," and she's like, "That's original." <laughs> yeah. like, that's your tits. Like, like. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, I mean, like, I don't know what he does. He does, like, this weird shit involving, like, he gets free phone calls out of a payphone. He uses, like, this um, soda pop can. That's phone freaking. That was, that's a, a hacker thing from way back. It's, uh, so he's, uh, you know, 
he's uh, what they're doing when they show you him doing the uh, the the payphone stuff is they're showing you that he's he's acquainted with the world of hacking and freaking and stuff like that. Just to, yeah, I guess all that stuff. He's like crazy. He's like the electronic MacGyver. He escapes from the base. He escapes well, from his fucking yeah, base. Okay. Yeah, he escapes from the base. Well, I'm talking about the keypad thing. You know, when the guy's hitting on the chick, and he, you know, the keypad is moronic. I mean, like anybody can figure their way out of that shit. You could fucking hear the hear I the guess. tones. I mean, come on. Like, yeah, he took he took something that looked like hemostats. I guess he took hemostats, put them on a wire, connected that wire into a, a micro tape recorder, and then plays the tape, and yeah. that opens the door. He recorded the sounds, and then the sounds opened the door. It's like yeah, it's, you know, it certainly was worth a shot. I mean, you know, the thing sounded like a telephone with different tones. So it would it would, it would um, stand to reason that it's uh, that that. And, and well, I wouldn't have known that at the time. At the time, is that that like you get, that you make each number a different tone, so anybody standing there could just figure out what the code is. Mm. It's moronic. I'm sorry. But well, anyway. to be fair, it was the infirmary. Maybe they weren't. They locked him in the infirmary. I don't know why they didn't lock him in a security center instead of the the infirmary. I'm sure they have a brig, right? They gotta have a brig. I don't know. Maybe they don't. Maybe they just have. They have the infirmary and they have a. You know, I guess a nobody gets caught in that. by a retard. I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, okay. it was still cool. So he gets. He gets. Uh, and by the way, this movie passed muster. My nine year old sat through it. Oh. So, this movie, um, so we liked it. It's, it. It it holds up today for the it's, for the young. It is an incredibly fun movie. If if some of the technology is a little dated, but it's a very yeah. fun movie. Uh, it's it's a and great it's, meat and it's, it's a great meat and potato screenplay. It's a great it, screenplay. Um, so Broderick and and Ali Sheedy go to Goose Island, Oregon, where Stephen Falcon is living under an assumed name, Robert Hume, I think. Uh, and Stephen Falcon knows about this kid. He knows what he did. And he's trying to t he's trying to convince the kid just to let fucking World War Three happen, because I guess he's pissed off or something. He's pissed that he lost his his. Yeah, his well, his, with me, I moved here so that I could just get hit by World War Three. So he said, like, "Well, the most important thing that the computer could never learn was the concept of futility." He said that a, a computer never gives up; it just keeps going. And right. because he couldn't figure that out, uh, he gave up. So he stopped. If Joshua tricks them into launching an attack, it'll be your fault. My fault? The whole point was to find a way to practice nuclear war without destroying ourselves. To get the computers to learn from mistakes we couldn't afford to make. Except that I never could get Joshua to learn the most important lesson. What's that? Futility. That there's a time when you should just give up. What kind of a lesson is that? Did you ever play tic-tac-toe? Of course. But you don't anymore. No. Why? Because it's a boring game. It's always a tie. Exactly. There's no way to win. The game itself is pointless. But back at the war room, they believe you can win a nuclear war. But there can be acceptable losses. So you gave up? Decided to play dead? For security reasons, they graciously arranged my death. Extinction is part of the natural order. Well, shit! If we're extinguished, there's nothing natural about that. It's just stupid. Oh, it's all right. I've planned ahead. We're just three miles from a primary target. A millisecond of brilliant light, and we're vaporized. Much more fortunate than the millions who wander sightless through the smoldering aftermath. We'll be spared the horror of survival. I'm only 17 years old. I'm not ready to die yet. You won't make a simple phone call? If the real Joshua was still alive, your Joshua, you'd do it, wouldn't you? Look, we might gain a few years, perhaps time enough for you to have a son and watch him die. But humanity, planning its own destruction, that a phone call won't stop. And that's what Matthew Broderick ends up teaching the computer, is that it's futile. Yeah, tic-tac-toe! Damn, see, I ruined it. Spoiler alert! <laughs> well, that's what uh, happens. Eventually, I mean, they're, like, arguing, and he's about to give up until a helicopter shows up. Falcon calls in the troops. They grab the kids. They go to the base. And Broderick is, like, 
trying to teach the computer the futility of playing tic-tac-toe. And then the computer finally understands, wait a minute, it's, 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 this is pointless. This game is pointless, therefore nuclear warfare is pointless. It's a very kind of an upbeat, kind of a happy ending. I don't know that it would actually play out like that in real life. I think the computer would just continue doing it. But, uh, but it, it was a fun movie. It is such a great, fun, nail-biting thriller with great performances from everybody. Dabney Coleman, he is like the prick of the 80s. Every movie that, yeah. qu- that required a prick, they were like, get me Dabney Coleman. Get me Dabney Coleman. Yeah. <laughs> He's great. Can I have a piece of toast? Get the fuck out of here, Jack. You are now listening to Extreme Cinema with Andrew Legank and David Lawler. And then there was that ill-advised one where he wasn't really a prick called Short Time. Oh, yeah, yeah, very yeah. Very interesting concept, but man, not that's really about, yeah, out yeah. Very that's well. That was one of the last ones he did, actually, right? I mean, like in that yeah. time period. Because he was another guy who was like only could only exist in the 80s, like Steve Gutenberg and people like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, he played a cop who was, who, uh, was trying to get killed so that his, his, well, he his, gets an, an erroneous, uh, um, uh, like uh, diagnosis that he's only got like a certain amount of time to live, yes. and he only he'll he'll only collect on his his wife only collect if he the dies in the line of duty, right? killed in line of duty. So he right. just like goes and starts taking all these insane risks. Right, which, right. This would be a fun movie if they had had a better cast and like like <laughs> Matt Frewer is wrong, and so is uh, so so is Dabney Coleman. He just doesn't work. He doesn't fit in the and role. And Terry Gar know. plays his wife in that movie. And... Yeah, Terry Gar. Yeah, Terry Gar was in that another, in a couple other movies. She was in she Tootsie. Also? She yeah. was in Tootsie with Dabney Coleman. Dabney Coleman also was in, he played the prick chauvinist boss in 9 to 5. Oh, yeah, of but course. Then, That's famous for him, yeah. But then he also played Jane Fonda's um, fiancé in On Golden Pond. So he went from playing her fiancé in On Golden Pond to right. her prick boss. <laughs> oh, God he's a great him. actor. God, he was so good. He was such. He's still out there, actually. I see him on um, MeTV. He does commercials. Really? Occasionally for me TV what, for, for what like reverse mortgages or no something? no 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 he's just there he uh they do like uh they have they bring in a bunch of people to do uh, Columbo impersonations so oh. they bring in people like Kevin Pollock Ed Bigley Jr. and then they brought in Dabney Coleman to oh. try and do one too so he's still he's still around yeah Kevin Pollock does a good Columbo he's not doing reverse mortgages though <laughs> oh. oh okay yeah I'm, a, I'm Dabney Coleman former eighties prick. You having yeah. a problem paying off your house? Well, fuck you. you. Remember me from such eighties prick movies. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, great, great movie. Again, we have cinematography by William Fraker, another great cinematographer, along oh, with John Alonzo. Awesome. And uh, Arthur B. Rubenstein doing the, um, the. This movie was made by United Artists. It was a big hit. Made eighty million dollars at the box office in eighty three on a twelve huge. million dollar. Huge. And they, they even eventually made a belated and ill-advised sequel to it. Yes, um, I believe. What is that? Like War Games? Later. The Dead Code in 2008. It was fucking horrible. Direct to DVD. It was nominated for uh, three Academy Awards. The sequel? No, no, no. The original. <laughs> <laughs> no, that one was nominated for Raspberries, dude. <laughs> and the Raspberry goes to Dead Code. Uh, <laughs> it was nominated for Best Cinematography, Best Sound, and Screenplay. Original screenplay, and uh, really well deserved too, because it it's a great script. Great movie. Very, very tense. Very like a lot of fun. Big fun movie that's yes. easy, easy to engage with and get sucked into. And it's have very a, much. Have a good I, time. I, it's very much a Doctor Strange love for our generation. <laughs> kind of, yeah. yeah. That's a good, good way of putting it. All right, um, let's stop for a minute and talk about a couple of the movies that. We're not going to really review just a couple of things from his oeuvre. One thing I did want to mention, because, again, yeah. we go to machines uh, turning on, on their creators. I, would, I just want to mention for a second Short Circuit, because that's okay. a very similar kind of uh, situation where you have, like, except you have, a, it, this guy's, this is a cute robot. Yeah. And we have Steve Gutenberg actually, in this with Ali Sheedy, of course, again. Number 25. <laughs> Number five alive. <laughs> <laughs> And he's looking at Ali Sheedy in the bathtub and saying, nice software, which is just, oh, come on. <laughs> come on. Who, who gave this this robot terrible jokes? <laughs> yeah, really. But this one was uh, a... Don Bass didn't direct the sequel, did he? Somebody um, else did the sequel. 
I, yeah, I didn't see his name there. Short Circuit 2 was directed by Kenneth Johnson, strangely enough, the guy who gave us V, which is an excellent miniseries for television, and huh. The Incredible Hulk. He did The Incredible Hulk TV show. Uh, hmm. Yeah, this is like, I, I guess you have a laboratory. You have Steve Gutenberg as a programmer. This movie takes place in Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, I think now I was talking to... Um, David Anderson, and he said, I think the reason for shooting a lot of these movies in places like Oregon and, and Washington State was that they could go right over the border to Vancouver and shoot with lower tax, with, with bigger tax incentives and a lower budget. Probably that makes uh, that makes a, a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, because there are some places, especially when I was watching Stakeout, I realized that I've seen this road so many times before that this chase scene is taking place on. Right. I've seen it in television shows, namely like the X Files and stuff like that, but. Um, but uh, here, I mean, like, I guess Johnny Johnny Five just sort of takes off and winds up in, in Ali Sheedy's home, and she gets together with Steve Gutenberg, and it's very cute. It's just a cute, harmless, kind of it stupid is. movie. And Fisher Stevens is an Indian, <laughs> and that's awesome. Can't do that today. Not allowed to do that today. You'd have to hire an actual Indian, and it wouldn't be as funny. Can I ask you, though, when what? you see Indians on TV and in the movies, it seems to be an incredible... Incredible, incredibly impersonating ins fucking Fisher Stevens. They, 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 they're always talking like this. Why are they always talking? Every Indian I've ever known never talk like this. They usually have British accents and they sound like this. How are you? Yes. Oh, no, I've known some. I've known some. Have you actually like known people, people who like sound like this? Like, do not talk when I talk. Do not talk when I talk. <laughs> <laughs> you, do, you do that very well. <laughs> I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you I used to do it with prank calls when I was. A Have kid. you tried to nick it down and off again? <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of IT people. Or something. <laughs> I don't know. You have a more of a clip at the end of what you're saying, so you're clipping your words, and it sounds more authentic. <laughs> I sound oh, a little too much like like uh, like Apu, but yeah, you sound you sound like some of my delivery guys sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, now he worked with Richard Dreyfuss before Stakeout on a movie called Whose Life Is It Anyway, which I did enjoy. I thought that was a good, okay movie. I never saw that. It's about a guy who gets paralyzed or something and wants to kill himself, and everybody's fighting to keep him alive, and he's just like, I just want to fucking die, you know? Oh, that sounds totally yeah. awesome. We can watch that. <laughs> yeah, it's two hours of that, basically, a guy in bed yeah, arguing. Totally. Gee, I'm <laughs> so sorry that I missed that. <laughs> Fuck me. Okay, but before that, we have Dracula with Frank Langella, which I did. And I also enjoyed that one, too. I never saw that either. It was interesting because when it came out, they added color to it. He wanted it to be have a desaturated look because he wanted it to look more like a classic old horror film, and they right. added color to it. And then uh, a few years a few years ago, a DVD came out, and I think it might be out on Blueberry. I'm not sure. I have to check on that. But he got his cut of the movie put in in its place. Uh, now, before that, of course, Saturday Night Fever. You know, that, when John Travolta wasn't taking people's faces off, he wanted to be a dancer, so right. he started dancing. <laughs> oh, and then <laughs> dancing. Now, before that, his first movie was actually Bingo Longo Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings starring Billy Dee Williams and, and Richard Pryor and uh, James Earl Jones. And uh, that was that was a fairly popular movie, too. I'm taking, not familiar with that one, either. I'm, yeah, taking, I'm, I'm not up in my John Badham, I guess. I'm, another big hit. I don't know another, late John Badham. So all of these were, were actually big hits. And like I said, it wasn't until after The Hard Way. I think The Hard Way was the last. His, his next movie after The Hard Way was Point of No Return, which was a sequel to, or not a sequel, I'm sorry, it was, it was a, a remake. It was a remake of La Femme Nikita. La Femme Nikita no by Luc Besson that starred Anne Perriot. Yeah. And this one had Bridget Fonda in it, Gabriel Byrne, Dermot Mulroney, Anne Bancroft, Harvey Keitel. I, I did enjoy Harvey Keitel in it, though. <laughs> he plays <laughs> the cleaner. Know. Yeah. He uses, like, uh, acid to, to to get rid of bodies after, after this. Yeah, movie. he's the cleaner. Yeah, yeah. They turned her, I guess. And, uh, Nick, of time, Nick of Time was meh. I mean, there's Nick, real time, and that's cool. I, uh, incognito. I, I, what the fuck is I that? I don't know what that is. I want to talk about Nick of Time for a second. I did enjoy that movie. It's it's very Hitchcocky, and it had this thing. Johnny Depp, uh, his his daughter, I believe, gets abducted yeah. by bad guys. Yeah, his um, daughter gets abducted, and he has to kill somebody. And he has to, to kill somebody. So it's very similar to that movie that we always talk about that Larry Cohen wrote called um, yeah. Phone Booth. Uh, phone, phone Booth. booth. Okay, one more note about Batman before we get into Stick Out. Stick Out. Yeah. Uh, there's a really good movie that he made back in 1985 called American Flyers. I really like that one a lot. I've heard of that, and I've never seen it. 
it's guys on bikes with uh, with possibly life threatening illnesses, and they want to finish this bike race. I'm not big on bike races or bike race movies. I like the drama of this movie, though. I found it very. But is it as good as Quicksilver? <laughs> it's better. It's better. <laughs> Oh, one more thing. Bird on a Wire. For some, my Bird yeah. on a Wire is one of my wife's favorite movies. I believe it's Mel Gibson and Goldie Hawn. Yeah, I and I don't really know what it's. A, I, I'll tell you uh, this: it's one of these movies that is rated PG. Mm-hmm. I believe it's rated PG. Hey, I thought it was thir- PG thirteen, but yeah. But it's actually very graphic. There's a lot of graphic violence in it, especially what happens to the bad guy at the end of the movie. That that mm-hmm. much I do remember about Bird on a Wire. Bird on a Wire was largely forgettable, but it was kind of fun. I mean, it was okay. It well, was. You have, a, you have was... a very good cast here. You got you got David Carradine. Yeah. You got Bill Duke, who I've seen a million times. You got um, um, Stephen Tobolowski. That guy is in everything. Yeah. And uh, but this was a huge hit, actually. Bird on a Wire. It, it was but... made on a twenty million dollar budget, and it made one hundred thirty eight million dollars. So it was obviously it was a huge hit for 1990. Yeah, it did, it did pretty well in 1990. I, a matter, as a matter of fact, I, I saw that at a press screening, sitting uh, like two seats away from Barbara Walters. Oh, Baba Waba. Yeah, <laughs> Baba was, Waba. So what was she God, doing? She, she was a bitch and a half. My <laughs> God, I never heard anybody wa- at the you know at the beginning. You know, you know We're coming in and like you know she's like pissed off about something and like maybe that like there were other people at the screening and she didn't want them there and like you know I had a ticket to this thing. I don't understand why I'm sitting here with all these commoners. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, ugh, I don't want to say it. That was basically okay. what it was. She was being nasty you know to like, you... her people that were with her and nasty to everybody else. Like, babe, you're a well, bitch, she was, man. She was nasty to Corey Feldman that time, too. Oh. Yeah, she's a nasty old bitty. That's what she is. God damn. Oh, my God. You have, okay, now you have a job to do in What's the next that? few years. you got to write her biography, and you got to call it Barbara Walters' bitch and a half <laughs> or call it or call it barbara walters nasty old bitty nasty old bitty <laughs> now that's the subtitle it's called bitch and a half how barbara walters made it through her career as a nasty old bitty <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, I'm turning red. I'm turning fucking red from all the laughing. <laughs> all right, all right. That's enough with Baba. God, we're so ni- we're so nasty to her. Jesus. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> hey, she's nasty to her people. She started it, man. Like, <laughs> well, I remember, I, I remember my wife told me one time that she saw um, Tony Randall. Yeah. And he was pissed off. And the reason he was pissed off is because somebody stole his car. Somebody moved his car. So she was like, it sounds so funny, Tony Randall getting pissed off because somebody took his car. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I've heard. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I used to hear stories about him, but I don't remember. They don't stick in my mind. It's, you know, he was from the neighborhood there in the Upper West Side. So oh like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, probably yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of celebs lived up there. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, Stakeout is next from 1987, an American crime comedy film, and I really think it's more of a comedy crime film. It's more of a comedy for me. What do we got? So who are we watching anyway? Her name is Maria McGuire. Long brown hair, brown eyes. Mm. 313 pounds. 313 pounds? Let me see that. I would imagine that's fully clothed. Oh my God, how she could be the house. This is disgusting. I hate this job. Two undercover cops on the trail of an escaped killer, staking out the house of his unsuspecting girlfriend. I think she's gone on a diet. Everything was routine. Lucy, you got some explaining to do. <laughs> Until one of them stepped out of line. I was supposed to be watching the house, right? So I was watching the house from the inside. Out of the shadows. What a bozo. And into the picture. I don't believe this. You like spicy? I love spicy. I'm gonna kill him. You're nice. I'm not that nice. Look, Maria, there are things about me that you don't know. I don't know your name. Oh, uh, 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 Bill. Get out of the house. It's you I want. Get out of the house. (laughs) Guess who this is? Cover me! (laughs) Nothing going on here, just some dull old police work. Honey, I'm home! No funny stuff. No funny stuff. You used to be a hell of a cop, man. Uh, well, uh, it was uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, some... Uh... You've been watching me? I'm not going down with you. I hope you believe in reincarnation. Yeah, I think 
think you're right. I screwed up. Touchstone Pictures presents Richard Dreyfus and Emilio Estevez in a John Badham movie. Did we uh, practice safe sex? Probably, Probably not. not. Stake out. Who says a little danger can't be a lot of fun? Is it love? Is it love I never saw this movie uh, when Shoot. it came out. I had to watch it. I watched it last night. I, it was something I always meant to, I guess, get to, but I was just not interested enough to see it. Even working in video stores for years, I never picked up like the videotape and, and took it home and watched it. I, I was just not... It didn't seem to interest me. Really, I watched it repeatedly over and over and over again for a long my time. My wife saw it, too. My, my thing, you know, when I was a kid. Yeah, my, oh, my wife saw it. She was like, you never seen Steak Out? And I was like, no, I never saw it. She, my wife has, my wife loves Madeline Stowe. She's got like a girl crush on her, one of her few girl crushes that she has. <laughs> she loves Madeline Stowe. And I got to admit, Madeline Stowe is extremely gorgeous, and especially yeah. in this movie. But um, but it's like, okay, the whole thing kind of, like, it, it seems like, I don't I don't know what's going on here, but it seems like great minds think alike in a certain way, because this is, it reminds me so much of Lethal Weapon, even right down to the, the typeface and the credits. It looks like something that could be like a lethal weapon type thing because it's it's kind of like a crime drama with elements of humor but again this is like more of a more of a comedy than anything else even though it starts off kind of with we have aiden quinn getting uh arranging it yeah yeah an escape from prison he sets up a fake fight with his fellow inmate and it's really clever actually how they break out of prison it is and then and we it's get tense. And it's uh, it's it's a little violent. It's it's kind of a lot violent. It's uh, but it's tense. It's it's exciting. It's a good opening to the movie. I don't know if it's a good opening to a comedy movie about yeah. two bumbling cops, yeah. you know, <laughs> screwing around with with their with their person with the Just woman that they're supposed, around. you know, um, guarding. But yeah, yeah. And there's a little bit. Did you catch the John Badham dialogue that I know he threw into that script? <laughs> Which part? I yeah, Aiden know. Quinn is like uh, he's breaking out. He's he beats up the doctor and he says, he says, you shouldn't just, uh, like, uh, put, so you shouldn't put oh, drugs, yeah. drugs in, put in drugs prison. Or something like that. Yeah. 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 That, that's very much that kind of subversive paranoid dialogue that Batman would probably write right. into that script. Check out the big brain on Brad. You're a smart motherfucker. That's right. And, and I think that the tone problems and stuff, it's like Jim Kauf has done lots of movies like that. And, um, He's, you know, he kind of moves oh, back and quick, forth yeah. between the. Uh, for for him, it seems easy to move back and forth between the tense violence and the uh, and the comedy, um, and so oh, sometimes no. he does it in movies, sometimes he doesn't. Like you know, like for instance, he wrote Disorganized Crime, which is a very flawed movie, but still is that another goofy Watson. comedy kind of a thing? It's more. It's not really goofy though. It should be way more goofy, and it's not. But mm. it's like like. I love it anyway. I just love that movie. Well, he wrote Class. Why. He co-wrote Class, which is like, I love that movie, actually. The one with Rob Lowe, Andrew McCarthy. I never saw that. It's God, a good I'm movie. A, it's a good movie. It's like an 80s sex comedy, but it's it's a very well-written 80s sex comedy. I should have been watching more vintage cable box before. <laughs> uh, he wrote Up the Creek. I remember that. Mad Magazine produced that. That wasn't that funny. Eddie Deason was in that, I believe. American uh, Dreamer. Up, Up the Creek was part of, like, that was one of the first R-rated movies my parents let me watch on video at home. So, like, I, I watched the shit out of that movie. And that girl's there, there it's everywhere. And, <laughs> and, uh, and and Tim Matheson was funny. And the guy from St. Elsewhere, you know, the, yeah. the fat guy from St. Elsewhere, he was funny. You know, it was, uh, that was a good, 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 good movie. Yeah, actually, and it says here he wrote The Hidden, too. Yeah, yeah, we, and we must have talked about that during the hidden because we probably saw it on IMDb when we were doing the show uh, or uh, during research. It's or an whatever. alias, though. He has it under an yeah. alias. Yeah, but we must have seen that. We mu I, we should go back and look at the show because we must have talked about it. But yeah, he wrote the hidden. How about that? I like, yeah, you know, Jim Kauf. It's unusual. I don't know what 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 seems to be Cal, uh, Jim Kauf's, uh, um his particular skill is combining two different uh, genres and putting it is. like a movie like. Class is very dramatic, but it's also very funny and kind of romantic. Up the Creek, well, that's just goofy. American Dreamer, Secret Admirer, he likes to mix comedy with drama. Right. He also and did Operation Dumbo Drop. Long <laughs> and interesting. I mean, he wrote National Treasure movies. He, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. he's done he's done a whole lot of like like interesting stuff. Um, I mean, and then, and then off the like like Operation Dumbo Drop. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
the, followed by gang related. That, that's the, if I'm not mistaken, the movie with uh, Jim Belushi about fucking <laughs> gangs in in yeah Jim Belushi and Tupac Shakur. What a mm-hmm. combo! <laughs> okay, now I think one of the big problems where we're talking about tone in Stakeout is that it's a little too broad of a comedy. It's a little too goofy. Yeah, it it you can make a movie like this. You can totally make a movie like this with a sense of humor, but. Try try to make your cops a little more serious about their job because I feel like these guys are kind of goofing off. You got okay. Yeah, that's the problem. They're goofing off too much. However, you do buy. You don't buy Emilio Estevez so much, but f- somehow they get you to buy Richard Dreyfus. They they do until he until. Well, let's we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> well, basically, okay. So they escape, right? The cops put two and two together and assume that Aiden will try to shack up with with any particular like. Uh, person that he knows from his past so they they have a whole file on everybody that 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 he might try to uh to lay low with right and 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 it turns out that it's madeline stowe's character right uh, and they don't think he's girlfriend. really going to go there which is why they assign it to local cops in seattle instead of the fbi actually coming yeah they think they, they think, think they're bullshit. just going to be jerking off yeah so they're... basically across the street in a dilapidated house just keep tabs on her and everything like oh, that. It was fun. How awful was Forrest Whitaker in this movie? <laughs> like, I thought it was really funny because number one, I mean, like he was—he wasn't bald and his eye wasn't as lazy as he usually is. You know, his, I mean, because it was a long his time. His delivery ago. was so terrible, and like you, they are. Yeah, what are they? They—they're like the uh, the cops that they're always yeah. busting their balls or something. Yeah, right? they're the, the the rival cop. Because we set up because it's very formulaic. Reputation. The whole thing starts off. It starts off in a very much a cop movie formula where the screenwriter gives us an example of their abilities before launching into the story. There's a fight between Dreyfus and a bad guy. His fish is being dumped on him, which is horrible, gross. Yeah. The, the, the bad guy gets away. They're not the greatest cops in the world. So, right. you know, I found that I found that a little refreshing. They're not that great. Right. Okay. They're terrible cops. Right. <laughs> they spend too much time writing each other. You know, I mean, it's like, but, but. But Dreyfus and Estevez work extremely well together. They do. You totally believe them. They do. Yeah. You, and everything, yeah. you know. And you really the, believe you really believe Dreyfus, like you know, like when he's challenging the FBI guys, and the and, you know how he gets along with the captain and stuff. Like he's, you know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, There's a black, angry commanding officer. Yeah. Again. And and you know, <laughs> we're here to nail those cash and dash fuckers yeah, to the wall yeah, with a twelve-inch railroad spike. <laughs> 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 you always get that. He's gonna. I was like waiting for him to say, "Give me a badge," <laughs> but he didn't. He's actually kind of like a kind or gentler. Yeah, he's kind of quiet. Thousand... And he's kind of like, and it's it's a cool character because he's kind of like, eh, whatever. He's like, whatever, just shut up. He's like, <laughs> he's like a less like, angry right? Bernie Casey. Yeah. Bernie Casey, a little less angry. Yeah. yeah. Rest in peace, Bernie Casey, who just died recently. I think. Did Bernie Casey die? That's too bad. I, I believe he did. Yes. No, he did. He he died September nineteenth, twenty seventeen. Wow. Yeah. Wow. He was six four. He was a big dude. And he was a football player before he became an actor. He played for the Forty ers and the Rams. Holy shit. Damn, I didn't know that. I only knew him from like black exploitation movies. Oh, and, yeah. And kind of like Jim. Spies Brown. like us. No. They get this assignment to do the stakeout on Madeline Stowe's house. For some reason, they're told that she's five. She's five six and three hundred thirteen pounds. And I don't know what the fuck the point was because the woman is not three hundred thirteen pounds. She's not even one hundred thirteen pounds. Uh, that was just what was in the file. So they were just you know <laughs> reading the file, and that's just a, you know the source of a couple of jokes. Because she got a great ass, and you got your head all the way up it. So, but they get into this fight with the FBI, like you mentioned before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like the typical jurisdictional pissing contest thing. This always happens in action movies involving yeah. cops. This is our jurisdiction. No, oh. fuck you. This is our yeah. jurisdiction. Like, you FBI guys aren't coming into my town. Oh, yes, we are. <laughs> and, th- and I think this is when Emilio Estevez lets out that little gem, lick my left one, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I do like I like the way he says it. He's like, if some bad people come here, he's like, he's like yeah. I'm gonna be a little too busy to make a phone call. He's like, I'm a cop. He's like, it's like, and I, I appreciate that little diatribe. I like that. <laughs> it's okay, yeah, but yeah, like you said before, the movie is pretty much Dreyfus's, and Emilio Estevez is really just very much a minor role in it. Yeah, because it's all about. An, it's, it gets a little unbelievable. First, I want to bring up Madeline Stowe, okay? Yeah. 
incredibly gorgeous woman. She's stunning. I love her eyes. She could gain a little weight though. I'm, I'm not a and I'm not a fan of her eighties hair. Oh, I'll take it. She's, like she was there. And she's her. She's two minutes into the movie and she's already taking her clothes off, which is kind of like the whole gag of this movie is that these cops are just watching her constantly undress yeah. <laughs> and take showers. And, you know, I mean, like... You, you have, have no arguments body. from me there. I'm all good. No arguments. Oh, God damn. You want to talk about fucking... Oh, forget it. Anyway, <laughs> I noticed that there was a Jaws joke. Remember the Jaws joke? We're going to need a bigger boat. No, it, it, Emilio Estevez says... Okay, oh, what, yes, what, what, yes, he yes. says, what movie is this from? This is not a boat accident. Yeah. He says, I don't know. <laughs> He's like, I have no Which idea. I thought was cute. <laughs> so we, we've got a goofy comedy on our hands, and it keeps going like this for a long time. Aiden Quinn is like, he's at the beginning of the movie, and then he disappears for like 90 or an hour and 40 minutes. And he doesn't show up again until toward the end. But I do like the dynamic between Dreyfus and Estevez. They, they work so well together. Uh, first, got to give a shout out to Lauren Dreyfus. Richard's brother, yeah, who is um, a friend of our my other podcast, Two Davids Walking to a Bar, because we did a review of a movie that Lauren Dreyfus was in called, oh God, what is it like, Detective School Dropouts? She I think it was movie called. With Lauren Dreyfus and Neil Connery, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 one of the Baldwins. Yeah. Got to find a Stephen Baldwin yeah. or something. No, no, not Stephen Baldwin. He's too famous. We need Daniel Baldwin. Or, we need Daniel Baldwin. We need uh, uh, what, Jerry. Baldwin. Nobody wants her around. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Lauren, Lauren's a fan of our show too. David's walking to bar, so you know. Oh, yeah. Hey, how you doing, Lauren? Um, <laughs> no offense. So okay, <laughs> Just when it gets actually, Lauren did appear in a Richard Dreyfuss movie, um, the movie Moon Over Parador. I remember Moon because Parador. yeah, Lauren Lauren played. Richard stand in, I think, in that movie, in a in a part where he had to be a dead body right. of this paramilitary dictator that Richard Dreyfus assumes the identity of. Right. Okay, so back to the movie. I just, uh, now this is where it gets ridiculous for me. Dreyfus obviously falls in love with Madeline. You don't just look at Madeline and say, "Ah, okay, whatever." Yeah. She he falls in love with her. He's seen her naked. He pretends to be a phone repairman or something, and she fucking buys this. This is what kills me about it is that the script really needs for her to be stupid the script requires that she be completely stupid to not be able to understand what's going on here well i sort that's, of chalked that up thing. to like it was the 80s and you know like she didn't understand how phones worked <laughs> well, yeah. okay that's what i mean i don't know uh, remember, uh, say, they, send all your hate people? email to <laughs> So they hit it off and like he, 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 he fucking he, he he gets to bang her and i'm like what what I'm like, number one, she's like, she's a 10 and he's a two. Yeah, I know. What up with that? Yeah, that's what Heather was saying <laughs> when we were watching it. Like, she's like, she's like watching him in the seats with her is icky. Like, it's gross. Like, it's it, weird, man. He's got to be also, even at that time, he's got to be twice her age. I know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, I did want to talk a little bit about in the middle of all this. A little bit about Richard Dreyfus. I he's a guy I've always he's always been like a solid, reliable actor. He's like Roy Scheider. That's you know, the whole thing kind of really works in Jaws with them, the dynamic between them and then the dynamic between the three men in Jaws. Yeah. And you have okay, the, what's great about the characters in Jaws is that you have uh Dreyfus who's a scientist and a city boy, college and all that. You got you got Roy Scheider, who is kind of a working man. He's the sheriff. He, he he's always had to work hard his whole life. And then you got like you know Quint, who's like this total you know macho kind of guy, right? Yeah. So they each represent different archetypes of what men are. Dreyfus being the, the scientist in that group, Scheider being the you know the working dude. And we we talk about Roy Scheider. We talked about Roy Scheider before with uh, right. with Blue Thunder. Right. He's always been a solid, reliable actor. He's always been a great actor. You know, he's one of these guys who's done so much great work that he gets an Oscar for sh for, for something that... I don't know. He got an Oscar for The Goodbye Girl, but I believe he also got one for Mr. Holland's Opus. Right. Which I didn't really care for. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I never bothered like to that. see don't... it because it looked fucking lame. <clears throat> well, actually, no. He was nominated. Never mind. Uh, but, you know... I think I, mean, I might have tried like... to sit through Mr. Holland's Opus, but it didn't work out. It was kind of like, what I was guess... it? The English Patient? Can never fucking sit through that shit either. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, the English Patient. I think the year that won Best Picture is kind of like the year that... That's the year that the Oscars died. Did the, yeah, something died. Yeah. Something died. Man. Although <laughs> it's still stinking say, up the place too. Like, <laughs> just just throwing it out there. I'm not sure if Titanic came out before or after. Right. Uh, but I did think Titanic earned its Best Picture Oscar that year. Yeah. 
but because that was like that was a movie that had everything. It had romance, action. It was a perfect date movie. It was a good way to go see a James Cameron movie without, you know, pissing off your girlfriend or your date or whatever. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 cool. I, 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 don't, I don't mind it so that, much. You know. That movie personally got me laid, <laughs> and it got me engaged. Nice. So that's know, good. Like and I guess game. it did something right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get did anything you take from it? Titanic did you... at all. So like, <laughs> you didn't get anything? You didn't take a date to Titanic or anything? I don't think so. Hmm. What was going on at that point? What was that? It was 1997. 97. Or, or, yeah, 1997 or, yeah, or the end of 96. I Who was know. I with then? I don't even know. I was too drunk to go. I didn't go on dates. I just 97, yeah. It was released <laughs> uh, It was released December 19th, 1997, around Christmas time. Yeah. Of 1997. That movie has made two billion fucking dollars. Holy shit. Uh, but, uh, okay, Richard Drivers, this is just wrapping it up. America, American Graffiti, Jaws, Close Encounters, Down and Out, Beverly Hills, personal favorite of mine. Um, lots of good movies. He made a lot of movies for Touchstone, actually. That's one thing I did notice about that, including Stakeout. So. Right. Good movie, uh, you know, good, reliable character actor. He's fallen on hard times. He lost all his money because he, um, he did a lot of drugs. You know, he did a lot of, like, stupid purchasing of properties and things like that right so what he lost a lot of money did it okay so back to stakeout this movie is an un- unforgivable male fantasy <laughs> that's what I, <laughs> I said in what in what world does richard Dreyfus get the court madeline stowe uh he's having dinner with her i'm like what the fuck seriously i would think if i were in madison madeline stowe's position i would think that he was a creep he was like constantly stalking her and he always seems to be around her and she's not putting two and two together here yeah but i will say i really like her house i like her house uh i like all the areas that they shot in they obviously shot a lot in vancouver you can see that in the chase scene that happens later on the production design in this movie is excellent because everything looks lived in it looks believable right it looks like a completely believable environment it really but does. the but the movie uh, is unbelievable because Madeline Stowe to me she doesn't look like an idiot so how she's buying any of this is ridiculous uh, she even bumps into Richard Dreyfus at the police precinct and he fact, fast talks his way out of it I'm like again I'm like what the fuck yeah. huh? she's buying this yeah. and then finally uh, Aiden Quinn finally shows up an hour and 20 minutes into the movie and then we get back into I feel like the, we're starting off with the story, then we're getting into the goofy comedy, and we're, we spend too much time into the goofy comedy, misunderstandings, it's like an episode of Three's Company, right? and then we get back into the cop drama. Right, and it's a little disjointed in, in that regard. I still enjoy it as a movie, but I think most of that, I think that if I saw it for the first time today, I would enjoy it less because it doesn't have that nostalgic value um, of being a movie yeah. I watched a ton of times when I was a kid. It definitely has that nostalgia. Great songs on the soundtrack. Yeah. This is like, this is such an 80s movie. It really is. Yeah. I mean, it really, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, like, it, it was, it, it kind of, it's strange because I was, I was watching the movie. I'm listening to the music on the movie and I'm looking at like how people behaved in the movie. It was a very 80s kind of thing going on. And I felt a little bit, I felt a little bit like, uh, you know, I remember kind of like what it was to be, I guess, uh, like a 14 year old kid or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of nice. <laughs> Strangely, I, I never saw this movie before the before I saw That's it. That's uh, shocking, because I, I mean, I, I saw it a lot of times. I was, it was uh, <clears throat> I had on VHS and watched regularly. I know the movie was not was a surprise hit. It was like right. a, a, a surprise hit. It wasn't expected to be as big of a hit as it was. Right. Um. Uh. It made like sixty five million, and 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 for a, an R rated movie in nineteen eighty seven, that was a big deal. Right. That's like on their list of top box office earners in the U.S. for an R-rated movie. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's very cute. It's a little too cute for its own good, I think, and it's a little too, you know, I. What did I write here? I said I don't think any. It's a very silly movie. I don't think it's meant to be taken seriously. It works more as a goofy comedy with crime drama overtones than anything. Good photography, good stunt work, good one-liners. The acting is good. It's basically uh, but, just a good night at the movie. Yeah, it has a heart. Yeah, the movie has a heart. It's really quite yeah. And, and and they did make a sequel, but unfortunately, somebody had a had the brilliant idea to put Rosie O'Donnell in it. Yeah, and that just ruined it. Which everything. I mean, you okay? This is how I mean. You know how you can compare men. Let's compare Madeline Stowe to Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> Technically, <laughs> they have they have what they have in common is that they're women. Right. 
right? Sort of. But one <laughs> eats one eats live babies and the other one doesn't. Possibly questionable. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah. We've already, we've technically, already gone Rosie after, O'Donnell's uh, a woman. Barbara Walters. I'm not going to get into Bob my Obama. my experiences <laughs> with with fucking Rosie O'Donnell. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do oh, it. We already talked. We we did talk about that. One of our first ever conversations on a podcast was some experience that you had with Rosie O'Donnell. Oh, God, <laughs> bitch with a capital C. Let me just tell you that right uh, now. <laughs> Wait, did you say bitch with a capital what? C. Oh, okay. See, now you got to write that book now. Rosie O'Donnell, bitch with a capital C. I can't take I can't take credit for that line. That was from Lulu. Remember Lulu? Oh, God damn. <laughs> you know, we were having fun. We were having fun, and then you had to bring her up. I know. Now, See, I, well, you brought up Rosie O'Donnell. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my fucking God. Bastard. Okay, um, so I want to mention Aiden Quinn and Madeline Stowe would appear in a movie directed by Michael Aptek called Blink, which I really did enjoy. This time, now Aiden Quinn in this movie, he's barely in this movie because he's like a bad guy. He's like the heavy or whatever. Yeah. And it ends, of course, with a climactic chase across the docks and into some kind of a paper mill or something like that. It's like your typical kind of action movie ending where it just takes you from place it's to place. It's pretty exciting. It's well done, the uh, the ending fight in this uh, in this wood mill with all these giant logs going through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and, and there's a, like even a almost like fight on top of the logs that are floating in the water, which is cool, and somebody gets trapped underneath it. Like, that was that was pretty cool. Uh, mm-hmm. um, but the, the, the inside the mill... Um, that that's it's pretty well done. There are all these logs going all over the place. Anybody could lose their head at any time. It's kind of yeah. I don't know. yeah. For some reason, Dreyfus winds up in a in a in a pit full of fish at the beginning of the movie, and then he's about to be chopped up for lumber at the end of the movie. Right, right. So Seattle has a booming economy. I would say uh, yeah. Absolutely. It's either fish or wood. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. I mean, um, I I did want to mention. Let me see. Blink Blink was um was more one on one with Aiden Quinn and Madeline Stowe. She plays a blind woman. He's a cop. Uh, because I had it a little bit wrong. I thought it was a little more on along the lines of uh, Eyes of Laura Mars, but but Bronwyn corrected me about it because she saw the movie in the theater. Again, Madeline I saw was her girl. I thought I, I really it's one of, it's like every Michael Apted movie, except one where it promises um, to be something, it, and then in the trailer, and then it's just not, and it doesn't doesn't not. get there. Um, for um, me, that was what I thought what, about Blink. Now, the one what, Michael Apted movie that I loved, I loved the trailer, loved the movie, is Class Action. Class Action, Mary Elizabeth Master yeah. Antonio and Gene, Gene Hackman. Hackman. Yeah, I love that. Play father and daughter lawyers. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, I remember that I one. I saw, that I think line I saw that is one. like, you eat so much as look at my daughter again, and they won't be able to identify you with dental records. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Hackman? Because yes. Hackman say that? Because that would make that me piss my before. pants. I love that line. <laughs> and that, that is a good one. That's right up there with I used to fuck guys like you in prison. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in this movie, I guess she's been blind for 20 years. She gets new surgery techniques to restore her vision, but then she gets vision flashes. Uh, she swears she saw a murder. She gets she hooks up with Aiden Quinn, who's like a sexy cop, and I guess they have a sexy love affair. It should take in like mute that. witness and cut the first twenty minutes off of it and spliced it onto Blink. Well, let's wrap it up. This is a John Badham we were talking about. Great, uh, a lot of great films, and they all made money um, until he got to I guess uh, until he got to oh, fuck man, lame ass hard. Damn life. it. Because that was crap. No, no. Hardway made money. Hardway was profitable. Um, it should have no been. Money. See, that was the problem. People were punishing him for the hard way. <laughs> um, I don't know. Well, I might have seen this. I do vaguely remember. Uh, yeah. What, what is it? Hardway is like uh, it, Michael J. Fox is an actor. Michael J. Fox and is an actor who's like. He's going along on a yeah. ride along with James Woods. Yeah. James Woods is like the toughest cop ever. And like they, they team up because the, 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 the actor who wants to be undercover. The, the only person who knows is James Woods, and he has to protect the guy, and it's like a public yeah. relations thing, and he hates it, and he's pissed off. And yeah, like, yeah. and it could have been – that's why that's why it makes me upset because it really could have been good, but it's not. And, like, it, and it totally should be. And, and, gotcha. and like, it, it bothers me. You know, there's many times like where I've watched it again because the idea is really good and it should be good, but it's just not good. It seems, you know what it seems to me like? It seems like one of these scripts that screenwriters write to sell. Right, 
Right. It's it seems high concept. It is high concept. Like what they call it is. It's yeah, just yeah. not but it's not well done. It, it's like like Badham didn't follow the script that they wrote to sell or something. I don't really know. The best thing about it right. is LL Cool J. Like <laughs> it's cr- Really? Yeah. <laughs> I like LL Cool J in um in uh, Deep Blue Sea, I love him in that. <laughs> he's the best thing about that movie too. Good old. I love when he thinks he's gonna die, so he's like, he's got he's got the video camera, and he's like, okay, I'm gonna show you how to make the perfect omelet. <laughs> <laughs> so he's doing a recipe for the perfect omelet. Um, oh, and the fucking shark eats his fucking parrot, which is <laughs> yeah. This is rage. This has been a lot of fun. I'm I'm glad we did it. Yeah, you always make me fucking go completely red from laughter, and now <laughs> now my back hurts I'm glad. from all the laughter. You should uh, consider stand up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hallelujah! Holy shit! Where's the Tylenol? What are we do gonna do next? I want to do I want to do one more, yeah. and then take a break. Do a you know like a, we'll do a season finale next time. But you mentioned you mentioned a movie or a director a. a when we started our conversation, that yeah. would be really good to do next, and I forgot who it was. Was it tonight? I mentioned it. Yeah, tonight, just just now. Okay, wait a minute now. So we were talking about this is before we, were talking, we started recording. When we were talking, we were talking about, about stakeout. We talked about stakeout a little bit. Then we launched into we launched into Blue Thunder. We were talking about Blue Thunder. Um, shit! What the hell was I talking about? You mentioned a guy who would have been perfect for a discussion. Oh, I can't. I'm gonna have to go back and li- listen to the tape, but I think that should be the next one for the for the right. for the season finale. I'm gonna have to go back and listen to the tapes as I'm editing and figure right. it out. Well, let me know. And then I'll, I'll set I'll, it. I'll up. let you know sometime this week. And uh, cool. But, uh, th- this has been Extreme Cinema. Thanks, Andrew, for joining me again. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And have a good night. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the oh, television sign off. Else. My bad. <laughs> you did the television sign off. You're like, oh. you too. So uh, long. You Thanks too. for all the fish. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for thanks for watching. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Fuck you. Cue the music. And then we all get up and dance in our chairs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna take my mic out now, out of my uh, my my double breasted blazer here. Yes. Take it out of your ass. We'll do it live. <laughs> do it live. Fuck it. Do it live. I'll write it and we'll do it live. <laughs> There's no words there. I can't. To play us out? There's no words there. You have been listening to Extreme Cinema with Andrew Legang and David Lawler. 